Hello, and thank you for joining us for the fourth episode of the Digital Transformation of the Legal Industry webinar series. This episode will discuss prosecution, receiving and reporting PTO correspondence, docketing, data document storage, work packets, drafting and filing papers and responses, reporting to clients. This is the fourth episode in an eight part series. A recording of the webinar and the slides will be made available to all registrants. We invite you to follow us on LinkedIn to see news about other upcoming webinars. And with that, I'll turn things over to our moderator. Hey, thanks Michelle and welcome everybody to another exciting episode in our series. <clears throat> We've got a great uh, uh, lineup of panelists today. Uh, we'll start uh, with Pam Hoff. Pam's a trademark principal at, at uh, Schwegman Lundberg Wismer. Pam's got over 25 years experience in uh, as a trademark uh, attorney. He's also a civil engineer. Uh, he's also a patent attorney, but focuses on trademark practice now and has a very large practice. Pam will be talking about um, you know, uh, trademark workflow here at, at Schweigman. Um, next uh, is Janelle Callis. Janelle is principal with Schweigman. It's a chemical engineer, has a, a very substantial practice in uh, prosecution and freedom to operate uh, as one of her specialties, um, mainly representing uh, chemical uh, clients. We have uh, Tom Marlowe, who's uh, the president of renewals at Black Hills IP and also the CTO over at Black Hills IP and former chief patent counsel at Fairchild Semiconductor. Um, Tom is gonna be talking about some of the technical details of how things are processed at Black Hills IP, which is a uh, vendor that uh, Schweigman uses to handle our automated docketing. Um, next, we have Ann McCracken, who's president of, of Black Hills IP and uh, is a former uh, uh, principal at, at Schweigman. Tom was a former attorney at Schweigman as well. Um, Ann has um, uh, many, many, many years experience, um, both as a patent attorney and as a professor, and, and then for the last 10 years at Black Hills IP. And uh, she's uh, an expert in patent process and tools for handling your back office, as well as an accomplished patent attorney. Um, and then last but not least, we have Ed Sander, Ed's principal at Schweigman. Um, Ed is uh, uh, primary practice areas are in uh, med tech and electronics, also does software. Um, Ed's a double E um, and uh, Ed's gonna talk today about our work packets and some of the uh, uh, process we use in prosecution. So with that, uh, let's roll forward. <clears throat> so before I, I kind of jump into this first slide, um, which is kind of what we do right now. Um, I just want to spend a minute or two just kind of going over the overall history um, without belaboring it. Um, but, you know, when we first started out at the firm, I would say that in a sense, we've been doing a digital transformation nonstop for the last, you know, 25 plus years. It started out there were really weren't there wasn't uh, really any email we started just when email was starting to come out um we had networks we had um well there was there was internal email but there wasn't uh you know web-based email so we <clears throat> we had networks and we started right away uh wanting to be as forward thinking as we could to try to get as much information you know into our network and we built our own um, IP management system. There wasn't a lot out there at the time that actually did much more than docketing. Um, and so we developed our own internal system. We started digitizing. We started scanning uh, all of the documents we had into uh, uh, essentially it was paper port files initially, which some people may remember, but uh, ultimately transitioned to PDFs. And we did all that. And, and, um, that kind of led to getting on the web. We developed Foundation IP. We ultimately, that was acquired by CPA Clarivate and that product is still going strong. We use it. Um, it's a great uh, tool and it's a great company. Um, so anyways, we, we then uh, realized we could get work done uh, offshore. We did that. 
and um, set up an offshore operation out of really necessity at the time because we it was during the tech boom and we couldn't find enough people in the United States to do some of the more mundane work like proofreading. And we realized, hey, we could get this done where there's more uh, free labor or labor uh, available. So we did that. And all, all this just kept evolving. And so then about 10 years ago, we started to think, okay, look, this is the future is really not offshoring. Um, it's really automation. It's really doing all these mundane tasks automatically and getting rid of as much, uh, you know, um, rote work as we possibly could. And so um, out of that, we started working on that. We spun off Black Hills IP now, and they started working on it. And so we now find ourselves here 10 years later after a lot of arduous work to automate uh, docketing and workflow uh, at a more detailed level, you know, where you really get into the weeds and you're identifying documents, you know, down to the Nats eyelash, which is what is required. So now we, we come to this point in time and, so we're going to talk today about, you know, kind of how it works now and how that is really fundamentally different than, you know, what we were doing in the past and how it's helping us. It's helping our clients. It's taking weight out of our, you know, if you're trying to climb a mountain, you know, the last thing you want is dead weight in your backpack. And so, you know, we're trying to get rid of the dead weight in the backpack. And a lot of that is is manual tasks that just burn time but don't add value. So what we do now uh, is, you know, <clears throat> we download, you know, we're starting on this slide now. So, you know, we download our, our, our USPTO docketing um, into a, a tool named IP Tools. When I say we, this is actually done by, by Black Hills IP as our vendor. So they have a tool and Tom will talk about this more. It goes out, automatically downloads everything at about four or five, four o'clock in the morning. And also we collect the emails that come in from the trademark office and those are forwarded to Black Hills IP and they all go into Black Hills IP um, cloud account where they collect all this data in the cloud. And then in the cloud, they uh, automatically process everything into our docketing system. Um, and uh, a good percentage, a high percentage of the U.S. docketing is now fully automatic. It 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 hits Black Hills IP at you know five o'clock and four o'clock in the morning. It's in our docketing system ten minutes later. Um, nobody touches it. Uh, it just goes straight in there. Um, and we'll talk about exceptions uh, too. But that's for the all the U.S. stuff and the foreign stuff also goes into that cloud. And a lot of that gets, um, it's all automatically processed, but some of it's uh, fully automated uh, after a little bit of help uh, from humans to get it on the right track. Um, so once it's been automatically uploaded in our docking system, the same tool will automatically send a report out to the attorneys and paralegals, um, depending on how it's configured, either goes immediately or uh, it could wait a day or for a, a verification cycle to go through because everything that gets automatically docketed also gets verified both before it goes in, but also it comes out and every item is verified to make sure that it comes out of the docketing system the way that we wanted it to go in. And not only that, there's also another set of rules that make sure that the dates that are added and stuff all make sense based on country law. So you've got like dot verification going in, you got verification coming out, you've got double verification. The number of errors we have now are just minuscule. Um, they're really non-existent um, uh, if for US docketing, automated docketing. Um, then the next thing happens is there's the same tools that we have. They automatically report a lot of the items to clients. Not everything gets automatically reported because some things we have to uh, do manually, there are exceptions, but many of the things we have immediately go out. So they're getting their email like, you know, 30 milliseconds after our attorneys get one, the system figures out who it's going to, what template is, um, what should be said, and off it goes. So, you know, the clients often know about things happening before our attorneys wake up in the morning. Um, and so that's kind of the first slide. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, so then on the opposite end of the spectrum, 
when uh, we file things at uh, firm, we will download a copy of that uh, from the patent center, um, which comes out of the patent center in a well uh, uh, tagged manner. And uh, we can then uh, send that off to this IP tools, which is a which is a Black Hills IP system. It'll automatically file those items into uh, our system foundation IP, but they also work into other leading systems. Um, and you know that includes CPI, AppCall, um, Patrix, all the systems that are out there leading that have APIs. Uh, and just as I always tell people, if your system doesn't have an API, you're stuck in the past. Um, you need to get you need to get one because you're never going to get into the future if you don't have a really highly functioning API. And uh, uh, CPA Clarivate have fantastic APIs. Um, and those other uh, companies I mentioned do too. Um, and then also those filed items are also automatically reported to clients um, uh, in the, in, for the most part with some exceptions. So let's go to the next slide. And, and here's the exception. So um, if something fails a, a verification test before we put it in, or it can't be automatically reported because it requires some input that we have to add to the report, um, there are not everything can be automated, but well, everything can be automated, but not everything is automated. Um, you know, then those get manually updated and, and uh, sent, but it's, it's all queued up. It's all sitting in the queue ready to be uh, completed and sent. So next slide, please. So I think uh, Tom Marlowe uh, is going to take it from here. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Steve. So taking a look at how one would or how we do automated uh, processing of items uh, when it comes around docketing and uh, communications. Uh, the way we handle this is when an item arrives, and this could be something that is pulled automatically from a PTO, it could be something that's emailed in or something kind of other, otherwise electronically um, submitted. Uh, we first step is to go and see, do we have all the documents that we need with respect to this particular communication? If there's more that we can grab, such as a trademark documents, it's a good example. Um, the communications that come from the trademark office sometimes don't have the documents attached. They have, you, you go out and grab them from uh, a TSDR. We'll go and grab those um, and any other documents needed. And we'll also go and pull PTO metadata. This could be an XML or JSON form, depending on where you're getting it from, from the USPTO, EPO, or other patent offices. Um, the images that were pulled and the PDFs that we receive then get OCR'd uh, so that we can make sure to extract critical information uh, within, those, uh, within those documents. Um, the, the labels from the patent office or the labels, uh, file names are, are generally not sufficient to get to the detail of docketing that you want um, within a system. So there's all this extra data that you want in order to kind of positively identify the document or the communication. Um, in addition to that, like what I've mentioned covers data around that particular document, but we also want to think about context. So we'll pull contextual data. That's going to be maybe an image file wrapper or a transaction transaction history. Um, it could also be the docket history uh, straight out of the docketing system. Another another reason where those APIs are beneficial. The idea here, though, is to com compile this robust data set around the communication and the matter. We want to identify the document or communication's purpose with a sufficient um, specificity so that it can be handled properly and, and, and docketed with, with the right deadlines and with the right um, workflow. We use rules um, like expert systems uh, that have varying levels of complexity to identify the document, but we'll also use uh, machine learning models that have been fit to various aspects of the document um, to supplement uh, the, that rule-based identification. 
Um, in, in some ways, the rule systems are, are great. In some ways, the machine learning models are great. And we found a combination of both provides something that is uh, we can put a lot of confidence into. Um, and uh, look, there, there are items that, that fail automated identification. Sure, this is a complex field, and especially when you're thinking about it in the global sense. But the cool thing is that each one of those items that's not identified is, is essentially an opportunity to build the data set, to build new rules, apply expert categorization, and in minutes to hours, we have an improved system that's better than it started. Uh, the, the bottom line here, though, is that data, the data is key, especially when paired with years of both manual expert and rule-based categorization that, that really help, help build those models. So if we go to the next slide here, um, once we're confident in what we're working with, um, we wanna make sure that the appropriate information is pushed into a docketing system to drive those deadlines. And you know, more importantly for the, the end attorney workflow, right? Um, Electronic integration, as Steve mentioned, is really important here. Um, APIs and web services, for example, help avoid many of the, uh, say, mistyping type errors that even, I suppose, the best of us can, can fall victim to from time to time. That integration to get data in, um, but also be able to get data out, saves time, saves errors and really increases uh, quality and efficiency. And the data out piece, that, that's particularly important for um, one of the aspects that we really don't want to overlook, which is quality control. Once data goes in, we've got to be able to get something out to ensure that appropriate and uh, expected data was entered and, and the workflow and deadlines that we wanted to have launched uh, were launched. And so this is, uh, again, like I mentioned, ideally done electronically. So when reviewing for errors here, human review, uh, it's brutal. Uh, very much like uh, the looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, the, the type of analysis that I guess you could say humans really struggle with, right, when you're trying to identify uh, one fit, one exception out of the many. On the other hand, computers are particularly good at anomaly identification because they can review things very quickly and they, their eyes don't get tired of looking at the same thing over and over again. Um, so uh, that, that pretty much uh, describes the way that we'll handle these things. And I, I know that was a lot of technical description, but Maybe on the next slide, we can take a look at an example to kind of put it to practice. Thanks, Tom. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to translate that and talk about what that means to you. Tom described a process that provides docketing, uh, allows docketing to be automatically processed into a docketing system. But what does that mean? There's a lot of confusion, actually, about what that means, because I see um, some docketing system vendors that advertise that they have automated docketing and people make a lot of assumptions about what that means. So I'm going to use an example today to show you uh, what we mean by fully automated docketing. And it's pretty incredible what that, what that actually can be. So in the context of this case study with SLW and with what we do here at Black Hills, um, let's just walk through the process. So uh, we're going to use, I'm going to use a, a office action, a US office action as my example. So the process starts with software first, downloading the docketing from pair. I think Steve mentioned that at the beginning uh, that happens early, early in the morning. We download the individual documents. Um, that by itself is not all that remarkable, but what happens after that is really remarkable because one of the coolest things that this technology that Tom described can do is it's very sophisticated in its ability to identify documents. Now, some other systems will have some very primitive 
functions to look at maybe the document name or the PTO name for the document and allow a action or an activity to be added in a documenting system based on that. But that's about it. So when you think about what your docketing staff actually does, though, they're making decisions on a lot of this contextual information that Tom's talked about. And that's what our system is able to do. Our system is able to replicate that thought process that the docketer uses when your docketer right now is determining what to docket into your docketing system. So that's things like looking at the text in the document itself, um, looking at information in your docketing system, maybe whether or not something has already been filed or not, looking at information in the image file wrapper, potentially. Um, all of this contextual information is used by the docketer when a human is making a decision about what to docket, and that's what our systems are able to do as well. So it's very, very intelligent. So let's think about this in the context of a office action, which would seem to be pretty simple to docket, but there's a lot of possible things that might be docketed differently when that document is, is processed by, by a software system. And our systems can detect these things. So for example, let's say you get a non-final office action. Is it a non-final office action with a three-month due date or does it have a two-month due date? Does it have a restriction requirement in it? Um, does it say it's non-final in the checkbox on the summary page on page two, but in the paragraph at the end of the action itself, it says it's made final. Is there a mismatch there? Or the really complicated one is, is it prioritized exam? Um, that one's really tricky from an automation standpoint because there's nothing within the document itself that tells you that the case that you're working on is um, one that's had a track one petition granted for prioritized exam. So all that contextual information that Tom talked about is available for our systems to look at to determine what to docket because many people have different actions that they docket in their system based on these different things that I mentioned, a three month due date versus a two month due date, prioritized exam versus not. So not to mention the other variables that could come into play here. Uh, maybe the office action says formal drawings are due or a declaration or a priority document. And there's all these different things. And the thing that I think is so cool about our technology is our systems can make all of those determinations without any human input whatsoever, determine what they're looking at, and then determine for the docketing system, and in this case study, Schwegman's FIP system, determine what needs to be added into that docketing system. So that's what I talk about when I talk about truly automated docketing. And then there's, there's even more things that go on top of that as well that can be easily automated. And these are things that are common steps in your docketing process that you know, right now I'm sure most people have people doing. But you think about it, many times when you docket something, there's actually more than one action that you're adding or updating in your docketing system. So a truly automated docketing process should be able to add multiple actions for a single document. Let's say, for example, you docket an office action, but you also need to docket a um, site art action, depending on the system, site art, supplemental IDS has lots of different names. Or maybe you add an office action, but there's something else that you close if you use kind of the older practice of status checks and you have to close a status check. A truly automated docketing process will be able to do multiple updates like that um, without a human being involved. Or another thing that's pretty um, uh, incredible that we're able to do is take an EFS receipt when you file something with the USPTO, for example, determine what's been filed with our software and with our software, de-docket those due dates in your, in your docketing system. Or, and Steve and Tom both mentioned this, the, the ability to, to verify that the docketing was done correctly. So all these things are things that um, take a lot of time. They take, uh, when you have humans doing them, these are all common steps in the docketing process. Um, but if your system requires a human to do any one or part of these steps, then it's not truly automated docketing. And you still, and you have a lot of opportunities to save time and free up your, 
your internal resources for other more, um, call them higher value tasks. So let's go to the next slide because I want to talk just briefly about another part of the process, which is the usually after an item has been docketed, there's some kind of reporting out that happens. That might be reporting out by sending an email to your internal staff, might be reporting out by sending an email to your clients. Uh, but again, that's a pretty time consuming and tedious process when you think about the steps and break it down from an operations standpoint into what you have to do to generate that report out email. Get the name of the recipients, add matter numbers, type in what was docketed, um, attach the documents. It takes a lot of time if you're doing any volume of this. And that also can all be 100% automated. So when we talk about automated docketing, we're talking about end to end from the point that the item is pulled from pair to the point that the item is added to the docket and then reported out and also QC um, verified quality control. Um, all that happens without a person logging into the system, uh, the docketing system or logging into pair. That all happens without a person touching it. So if you think about in your organization how much time that takes, and some of the statistics I've seen are that over a quarter of in-house legal professionals time, law firm staff time, is spent on routine low value tasks. Um, docketing is one of those areas. They're pretty time consuming and there's a lot of opportunities for digital transformation. And uh, so I just wanna get you guys thinking about what your process is and then where you could go with that process because all of these things are, are possible for everybody listening to this program. So once you've got all that and you've got this data you use the data for the docketing. There's a lot of things you can do with this data as well that you can tie into or trigger off of your docketing processes. And I think next Ed's gonna talk about some of those other things. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ed. Yeah, thanks, Anne. And so then after all of this neat stuff happens behind the scenes, that then we have to move forward. Like how does it actually look to the attorneys or the paralegals? or the clients moving forward, like what, what have we done um, to, to use the, these items in our practice? And I think, uh, I think, you know, if we've, if, if you started back in the, in the patent uh, or, or trademark game um, within any, uh, any years ago, we, we, we started with paper dockets. I started in 06 with paper dockets and the tapped folders and looking through things and printing off references. Um, and, Getting these monthly uh, these monthly task lists that were that were created by our paralegals and now this is this has changed a lot. So the first in the days when we went to we went to paper lists and viewing everything on our screens instead of printing everything off and then and then uh, incorporating our our docket management tools and the daily schedules of attorneys. So after Black Hills and Schwegman in the back end do all of their remote uh, automated docketing processes. What does it look like for the attorneys? We get a couple things every day. And I think the clients get the same type of action. So the automated message 24 hours after receipt, generally the attorneys get a report out saying, hey, we received an office action for this matter with just some general information. What's to the client, the matter, serial number, action, due date, and, and who is the working attorney on the message. And we also have incorporated a lot of this into our, we at Schwegman, we use the Microsoft Office tools. So we've incorporated a lot of it into the tasks, um, putting into automatically into our tasks, um, all, of, all of these separate items that are docketed. And we also get uh, a daily message that gives us the, hey, that 4 a.m. message, the task due today, task due tomorrow, tasks that were added to your docket today so every day you see all the different things that were added within the last day to your docket and then tasks coming up in the next two weeks. And you're kind of able to manipulate and see um, what's coming down the pipeline based on these um, automatic messages that we receive from the docketing side. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. So then we get, I think a client's get, and they're reporting now, it is a very similar email that, hey, you've received an office action from this. Um, and, and with a link to the document and, and a short description of what the task is, 
that or the matter is, and then and then which attorney to contact regarding uh, the due dates and strategy moving forward. Uh, behind the scenes, more more stuff as Ann and Tom were talking about. Uh, more stuff happens. So, so we put in all of this, uh, the office action and prior art, you know, in a in an office action response. We put it into this claim tracker tool in order to generate our automatic report shells. And so, no longer are paralegals or or case management assistants. They're not creating shells for attorneys to use. Anymore, it all goes automatically into the system and, and our merge shelves with current copies of the claims, whether or not last amendments were accepted or rejected, um, whether or not claims were withdrawn, restricted, all of those statuses automatically go into our system to kind of create an overall model of what are the current set of claims, what are the current set of rejections to the drawings, the specification, uh, terminal disclaimer, it, it, double patenting rejections, all of this stuff automatically co goes into this giant kind of model um, into claim tracker that we create our shells from. And so then the pertinent sections are automatically put into an office action response shell. And this is part of what gets sent to the attorneys when they have these new tasks and what gets put into our system. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. And then there's a lot of information. Once you capture all of this information, aside just, hey, what are the current claims? We also kind of have this model in the background that's tracking, well, what references are being asserted against what claims, uh, what combinations of references, if they're 102 or 103 rejections, 112, 101, what kind of rejections am I getting with what combinations of references from what examiner? And then whether or not we can flag certain things and certain pieces of information once we have these, once we have these uh, links in place to say, well, how has this examiner or other examiners applied this piece of prior art against my, this portfolio for this client in the past or this family of cases? What amendments have we made in the past to get over this piece of art or combination of arts? What, what, uh, what arguments carried the day? Um, what, what double patenting rejections did we overcome with which examiners? The, the information that we track and create in the models in the background get to be really, really interesting and they get to be used in different ways moving forward. And that's, not, that's all to say that this is all information that back when I started in 2006, you could kind of see if you were, if you were in depth into a group of cases or a, a client's cases and had all of that information in your head, you can kind of see those connections but this using these automated systems kind of pull all of those connections out for you. Um, so you don't have to trust on your memory in order to look back and, and rely on those things. Uh, if you wanna go to the next slide. So uh, again, back when I, when I started, we had the, the big paper file and then you asked the paralegal to create a response shell and you got that and you started working from it. And now, uh, then we went paperless and the paper files went away. And now we're, we're on to, we, we always had the electronic docketing kind of there in the background. You're trying to grab things off of there. But then if you look at how attorneys um, actually prepared responses or did their response work, we've tried to make that easier and quicker for the individual attorneys working in the system. And as Steve mentioned before, like we wanted to automate the things that burn time and don't add value. And, and so uh, even from a just preparing and putting all these documents in the one place, instead of having to go into a system and separately download all of the documents and then keep put, put them in a place. And if you're working at the office and at home, having different copies of those things um, secured and, and, and managed and who has the latest version of the response, if you're getting it reviewed and you have changes, just keeping track of all that was 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 an issue that we kind of all lived with and and now we're on to the days of you know multiple people working in the same documents as long as you're all looking at the same place and so in our response packages for the attorneys that we're creating we we've we've come on to this uh we create this common folder this this cloud-based secure common folder that we put everything into automatically put everything into so you, the thing that attorneys probably learned to do in the interim, which was create your folder of materials for this family that follows you around every three to six months when you're doing another action on it or a family of cases and, and having to look back. 
we've created this common folder that follows the matter around and all, always has all of the stuff that you need into it, in it um, broken down by action. So um, we create a common folder and then we have Outlook tasks uh, with the link to the common folder and links to each of those separate items automatically put into each of the working attorneys or reviewing attorneys uh, office Outlook tools. And, and so that's, that's really neat to be able to look through and organize and prioritize and sort the different type of activities that we have, when they're coming due, who you're working with, what is the current version of their draft? Have they done anything on the draft? It's, it's really neat to see all of this stuff right there. Plus, if, if you have any notes in the matter that like you were, when you were making the last response, if you had some ideas where you'd possibly go next time if this didn't work, or if you had some notes that you wanted to take based on, hey, when you had this interview with this examiner, this is what you, what you felt about that examiner, you can put them in this common folder for them always to be there uh, to follow you around. And if you're ever needing to offload work, it's really easy to just point someone at a link to this common folder for them to just pick up where you were having all of your notes, all of your past work, everything right there. And so uh, the, the information that, that is in these Outlook tasks inside the common folder is just like the reporting out, the matter action due date examiner, but it also gives you some, some interesting things like the previous number of responses or if, you know, how many previous RCEs you've been filed. And these, this all kind of comes from um, you know, working with a bunch of different clients. Different clients are sensitive to different things or want to know different information when they're making decisions moving forward. And as Tom mentioned before, as, hey, every time that there's an error, it gives you another opportunity to make your data better. Well, every client ask for us is, is a way for us to revisualize how we're approaching our workflow and, and, and how we're communicating what's important to clients in, in helping them make decisions uh, on how to move things forward. And so the previous number of responses quickly or the number of RCEs um, is something that's neat to pull out. I don't have to go look for it. It just tells me. And, and that's something that I can communicate quickly to the client in making decisions. Also the examiner, um, which examiner this is. And then the documents that go into that common folder are that uh, the action that we received from the office that was parsed and, 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 and from, the, from the pair copy, the response shell that's automatically created, uh, the prior arts that's being used against us, we the, are automatically right there for us to click on in the folder. Uh, the previous response that we filed, uh, application as filed, different analytics, and the analytics are, are, are really interesting. And these are, a lot of times, these are examiner analytics, but they're also different analytics as um, as to, you know, what's happened with the prosecution history of, of, of the claims themselves. And so uh, the, the examiner analytics are, 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 are quite interesting that go into there. Um, but uh, the claim tracker prosecution history is, is, is a quick way for you to visualize all of the changes that have happened to the claims in this application. And so you're able to see what the kind of the evolution of the claim terminology or the claim statuses as they've trans, as they progressed through the matters. And you can go look at family members and see how the claims have changed from when they went in to what they are at and then what art made what changes. And it's a, it's a really interesting way to kind of visualize what's happened to catch you up quickly to kind of see where you are in the prosecution status to give you the story of the prosecution history without having to go read every specific office action and office action response that's happened and kind of and, and, and digest all of that. Um, and last on the analytics side, uh, that, that is what I was kind of referring to, which is the claim history, seeing what's, what changes have been made. The prosecution, the prosecution analytics, um, which is how many office action responses and, and whatnot has gone into things. The examiner art unit stats is, is really interesting because we're pulling all of this information as far as um, saying, all right, well, we have a USPTO model of response, number of responses, number of allowances, how many appeals, what the appeal rates, and then we can, we can contrast that with this specific family, this specific client, this examiner, this exar art unit, and see uh, what hand we were dealt. Like we don't get to control always what, uh, what examiner we're given or even what art unit, but there are certain things that we can do to try and steer us in the specific art units, but then we're still kind of stuck with whatever examiner is assigned the case. 
and and we can see what the different uh, what the different strategies are better or worse for different uh, examiners and how that are, how they're how they played out overall. And so then the one neat thing I've seen us do that I haven't really seen anywhere else is that next action prediction. And that's based on looking at all of the data that we have, what are the, what's the likelihood that the next action is going to be an allowance or if it's going to be another, um, another rejection. And uh, that's just given the data of the examiner and their caseload and how this looks compared to other things. And it's really neat. Um, other things that are in there are pair history and then other checklist items. And the checklist items are specific to the matter that, that you're working on. We have different checklist items for, uh, for an advisory action response as we do for a non-final office action response as we do for an AFCP response versus a pre-appeal brief of appeal. All of those have different things to consider or if we're responding to a notice of allowance or deciding to respond. Um, and so on and so forth. So these are all the different things that kind of that, that are automatically put into a folder for the attorneys to, to consider and look at in making the decision as to how to move forward on a case, but also uh, in their conversations with the clients uh, as to try and determine what to do moving forward. Um, we're able to put all of this kind of a picture of what's going on quickly to put together to the client for them to give us, uh, for, them to, for them to make the decision as to whether or not to move forward and how to move forward. Um, it's all very interesting. So I think um, with that, I think uh, we're gonna get a, a little bit of discussion. So that's from the patent prosecution side. Now from the, from the trademark side, you're gonna, you're gonna hear from Pam and to how, how we kind of do things on the trademark side. And, and before, Pam, before you, get started i just wanted to give some attribution to a lot of the response package that uh, we have it came out of the mind of sunil aurora here who's one of our principals and sunil was instrumental in putting a lot of this together and it's and, and a lot of the other some of the features ed mentioned with you know the docket uh on, on the calendar and things like that so anyways just wanted to give some attribution there go ahead pam Great. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Ed. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, you know, on the trademark side of things, when I was thinking about what automated docketing did for us on the trademark side and our prosecution practice, I thought it was very helpful just from a visual standpoint to contrast um, what we do with automated docketing versus how we all used to do it. Um, and, you know, and, and I know Ed and Ann have both referred to you know, some of the changes and the things they've seen. I know, Ed, you were talking a little bit about you know, paper copies of things, um, but I thought this visual was, was helpful. Uh, and you know, when, I thought, when I think about you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, um, how we did it, but also um, at a prior firm, but also how some of the other firms I think still do it is you know, a lot of these duties fall, a lot of the docking duties fall to your IP paralegal. So, you know, you have information coming in and you, it is just a perfect recipe for um, error. And um, I, I mean, obviously very capable people are looking at so many different types of documents from the PTO. And, and I'm, I'm talking about this from the trademark side, but obviously this is applicable um, to the patent side as well. So you have all these different documents coming in and they're not just inputting data. I mean, they are, um, thinking about what the client's preference, you know, what is the client preference? Um, is this something that gets reported out to the client? You know, how many things do they want reported out? Um, and I know uh, many times um, most systems, um, even manual systems have a quality check. So you have a second docketer who is also um, double checking what was put in by the first person. So obviously very error prone, time sensitive, very slow um, process. Um, but I think the other thing that's interesting to think about is that um, these things are being done by timekeepers. Uh, as an aside, I also talked to someone who was telling me that their manual docking system actually had the attorneys reporting out many of the trademark documents, um, not just office actions, but if they had a notice of publication, if they had a notice of allowance, those things were actually getting reported out by attorneys. So you have all these different timekeepers who are spending an ordinate amount of time on um, things that can't be billed, uh, things that are very, very difficult to quantify. 
And so I know in years past, uh, when we were trying to uh, think of task-based flat fees, right? we were, you know, how can we give predictability to clients? I think that's something we've seen in the IP world, you know, over the years. I know on the trademark side, um, many, many tasks uh, are done on a flat fee basis. It was very difficult to determine uh, what is what does this task really cost us? Because we were having difficulty quantifying, you know, all of the docketing and the reporting out on the backside. Um, so uh, obviously having the automated docketing is removing all that. As an aside, I talked with an IP paralegal who years ago was doing docketing. Um, she told me that she spent typically an hour, sometimes hour and a half every day um, docketing. And so obviously not having that fall on her desk has allowed her to be much more efficient. Uh, next slide, please. So of course, now we have, you know, with automated docketing, we have a regular flow of information it, that is much more reliable. Um, I think it, it also, um, as I mentioned with IP paralegals and also the attorneys, it moves these tasks away from timekeepers. Uh, I think that the client, whether or not a client is paying for uh, someone to uh, to dock it or, or not to dock it, I think that they understand, you know, value add. And so when you have an automated system and you're able to tell clients that when an office action or some other document comes in, that they're going to get notified right away uh, and that they can make timely decisions based on that, as well as the attorneys making timely decisions, um, that is something that they understand. So it's been much easier to explain uh, the process, uh, what the client is getting, when they're going to receive information. And it's, it is really, for, for us, is really on the Tremec side, has revolutionized our ability to uh, predict and to, to have task-based flat fees that are actually accurate on the amount of time that is being spent uh, on, the, on the various tasks. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a little bit of a repeat as far as on the trademark side, you know, we see this, I'm sure, on the patent side as well. Um, but, but one of the things I'll just speak personally that I've noticed, you know, <clears throat> being on an automated, <clears throat> excuse me, an automated docking system is that my dialogue with client, clients is much more immediate. Uh, I think that's, that may seem obvious, but when you're actually in real life, real time, uh, I've just seen, um, it has just been an amazing change to our prosecution practice um, to know that um, clients are getting things within days um, of, of an examiner, you know, touching a file. And then our ability to then talk to the client about, you know, e even if we haven't filed a response or taken action with respect to what has come in from the PTO, um, we're able to talk to the clients about you know, what kind of a, uh, what kind of an initial reaction has an examiner had to your file? So an example of an office action, um, there's obviously many things that, uh, many decisions that are made um, based on how the examiners react in a first office action. Uh, you know, do we want to, how much do we want to budget on foreign filings? Do we want to be relying on this uh, foreign application or do we want foreign applications to rely on, um, on our US application. Uh, I've had you know, many clients who are making a determination uh, on, you know, is this really a mark we love? Do we love it enough <laughs> to spend uh, more money on prosecution? Those are decisions they need to make earlier rather than later. Um, so uh, it, it has revolutionized our practice um, for sure. And then of course, you know, you've removed these duties from timekeepers as I've mentioned, and so, our ability um, as a practice group to be more competitive and predictable with the pricing and to be more accurate, um, those things have really uh, improved um, astronomically. So uh, it, it's, really, it's really just changed our workflow. Um, and again, our accuracy, efficiency, there's so much more that we can um, give to clients uh, in an in a efficient and informed way. And so I think Janelle now is going to take it and uh, uh, walk us through an actual document report. Uh, and so Janelle, next slide, please. Thank you, Pam. Uh, as has, has been mentioned for the uh, uh, automated docket, docketing system, 
and actually electronic uh, prosecution system, <clears throat> the default uh, report is uh, to send out e individual emails for each docket item. And for small clients, this is fabulous. They can uh, see uh, actions by various patent offices. Uh, as soon as the, the examiner uh, completes them, uh, they're reported out and they can discuss immediately uh, with the attorney in, in charge of the matter. Where it gets a little bit uh, cumbersome though, are uh, for clients that have large portfolios. Uh, when an in-house attorney gets 20 emails a day uh, for various docket items, that can be overwhelming and they can feel like they are not really in control of, uh, of, of their portfolio. It's just too much stuff. So uh, in this instance, it's possible using the electronic system in conjunction with the electronic docketing system to develop reports uh, that combine upcoming uh, docket items in a variety of ways. Uh, this is what's presented on the screen right now is a typical docket report uh, showing upcoming due dates. And usually these are represented in order of, uh, uh, of chronology when they're due. Uh, the date type, uh, is it a final uh, office action or is it um, one of the interim dates? Uh, the file number, the client reference number, if there is one, uh, the country, uh, the application number, uh, title uh, is also included the activity, uh, the specific action that must be considered, such as a US filing deadline, uh, the filing date, status, uh, uh, the title of the application, uh, any correspondence contact, especially uh, if it's a non-US attorney or agent, and the, um, uh, in this case, the paralegal assigned. Now it's possible to get a lot more granular than this. It's possible to, for US cases, to uh, also identify the type of rejection, whether it's 112, 101, 102, or 103, which uh, can be useful when a, a client is looking at upcoming office actions and they see that they all have a 101 rejection. Uh, they, they can, it may be time to sit down with the attorney and see whether there's any way, and there may not be a way, but whether there's any way to um, to, to draft claims uh, in order to re reduce that, and that may, may or may not be possible, but at least the client can see that that is a predominant problem. It's also possible to generate uh, docket reports across patent families or patent application families so that you can see uh, all of the um, applications by country for a, a particular patent family. It allows you to have discussions with patent counsel uh, to see where the claims are, which where claims have been allowed to make sure that there's a consistency in claims across uh, countries uh, and, and also to look at the prosecution to make sure that, um, that there's not, there are not contradictions across countries in how um, cases are being prosecuted. <clears throat> I have found uh, it particularly useful to use this type of report in combination with a teleconference that includes in-house counsel, uh, law firm counsel, uh, paralegals, and sometimes even um, uh, country counsel, de depending upon the situation, and then go over uh, the entire docket for the next three months. Uh, what I have found is that, especially for large portfolios, this enables everybody to feel that they have a, a good handle on the portfolio, that nothing is being missed, that they are achieving the uh, objectives that they need to achieve in order to, uh, to have the best possible patent portfolio that they can. Uh, and, uh, and this is of course quite different from how uh, uh, patent prosecution used to be practiced, but I think um, it's a huge improvement and over time it strengthens uh, patent portfolios. Next slide. Yeah, this is simply a status report. Uh, it's a little bit like a docket report except it just um, 
it's a status of everything in the portfolio, uh, which cases are filed or unfiled, uh, which patents are in force, what are upcoming annuities. Uh, but it, um, it, it's more, it's useful uh, for in-house when their management asks them about um, the status of the patent portfolio and it, it can be generated almost instantaneously. Uh, so uh, yes, the, uh, the electronic age has created huge changes for in-house counsel and for uh, patent counsel uh, outside in law firms. Uh, but for the most part, these changes have been terrific, I think, because uh, they've allowed companies and uh, outside practitioners a greater understanding of uh, what exactly they're up against and the, uh, the quality of claims based upon other, especially based upon other uh, cases in the portfolio. Uh, and, and with that, I guess we'll open it up for questions. So thanks, Janelle. I, I wanted to, we had a couple of extra minutes, which is uh, unusual, we usually finish right on, on the hour, just to talk a little bit about um, what's going on now with the latest wave of, of uh, technology and innovation. And uh, <clears throat> reflecting on this recently, really came to the conclusion that um, while the IP management system used to be like a, you know, the place where you'd center all of your attention if you're managing IP in, the, in a law firm. I think in the future, that's going to, it, its role is gonna be diminished. Uh, it's not gonna be nearly as important um, in the future because there are just so many other places to get data that are actually better than what you might have in your IP management system, which usually, when it comes to data representative of things that are on file is nothing more than a, you know, a replica at best of that data. You hope it's an exact replica, but often is not. So I think that's gonna change things quite a bit. And you know, I think looking at what Black Hills has been doing lately is with all these automated flows and all this data gathering that is done. I mean, we talk about just downloading you know, the, the pair file or the PDFs from the portal, but they're really getting a lot more than that. Um, and you're gathering all this data, you're getting the XML file, you're getting all the electronic data out of the actual IP management systems, you're getting it from other sources and you're able to put it all into a giant data lake, if you will, and, and you can do things with that data that no human could ever even think about. Um, you can be aware of things that a docketer could never hope to ever be aware of and get their docketing done in any reasonable period of time. And I, I think it's, it's a completely different, uh, it's, a, it's a sea change, it's not just incremental. And there's also things that Black Hills IP is doing that you know the firm's also been exploring that are really, really, really interesting with docketing that's totally outside. It's not docketing anymore. It's something different than docketing. Um, I think it's to call it docketing is really under, you know, really misrepresents it. So you know, I just encourage you to to uh, if you're in a law firm or you know in a corporation to think a lot about how you can use these automated processes to your advantage. There's lots of things you can do and they're the wave of the future. I mean, there will not be anybody doing most of US docketing within 10 years, you know, doing routine US docketing will no longer be a profession. What will be a profession is configuring the docketing systems and dealing with the exceptions. Um, and even foreign docketing is largely being automated too. So the docketing profession is going to have a profound change. Um, all these data, these processes are going to go through profound changes uh, in not too distant future. Got a couple last questions to see if we can. Um... <clears throat> so FIPS API, the first question was about what, what is needed to, for FIP to update internal docking system. FIPS API will, will enable you to do anything you need to do for docketing. Um, uh, in your system. So, and that comes with, with the product. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, so there's nothing special needed there um, uh, other than their usual 
capabilities. One of the other questions was uh, predict the next office action applications. Um, yes, they I, are I able to answer that. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Yeah. yeah, so so this this particular the first action prediction tab from pair that is a, a data field that we use, but then past that, uh, as far as predicting um, uh, items during prosecution is the next thing I'm going to get another rejection allowance, what is the um, probability of one of these things happening. Um, uh, those are things that we use machine learning to uh, to determine with, with our own algorithms. And I guess that's uh, that pretty much wraps it up. I want to thank everyone for attending. And I really want to thank the panelists for their time that they put into this presentation. And uh, please uh, join us again in another month or so for the next episode uh, of our series. Be happy to share. And if anyone has any thing they want to share uh, with us, um, please feel free to email us and, and let us know. We're really interested in the topic and there's lots of different ideas out there. We'd like to hear them all. Thanks everybody. And Michelle, do you want to uh, take it from there and wrap it up? Sure. Thank you, Steve. The next episode of the Digital Transformation Series will take place on June 10th when we discuss an SLW Digital Transformation Case Study. Prosecution Part 2, Claim Tracking, Reference Analysis Tools and Reports, Prosecution Landscape Tools and Reports, Examiner Prosecution Analytics, and IDS Management. And you can find the registration page on the SLW Institute on the SLW website. And please keep an eye out for the email invitation as well. Thank you again for joining us and be well. <laughs>